I'm delighted to be here and get the chance to talk to you guys and have a dialogue with you. And that's what really this is going to be all about today is a dialogue. I don't have slides. I don't plan to present to you slide where about our company. If you have questions about NCR, I'm happy to answer your questions and I'm happy to take any of your questions about the company. But I sat earlier with a few students and kind of asked, what's on your mind? What, what, do you want, what do you want to talk about? And I got back a few things and I'm going to poll the audience to make sure I'm on point with what you want to talk about, what, where you're going to get the most value out of my time. The first thing the student said is, how did you get where you got? <laughs> how did you get here? How, how did you reach this point in your life? What, what, what were the things that allowed you to become the chairman and CEO of a Fortune 500 company? The second thing they wanted to talk about was how do we maintain innovation, keep innovation alive in our company? How do we do that? given we're 126 years old. The third thing was day in the life. Tell us what your day is like. Tell us you know, how your days usually go. What happens to you when you get up in the morning and if you get to go to sleep? What happens in that time frame? So those were some of the things that were on these students mind. Do they resonate with you by a raise of hands? Is that reasonable? Great. Anything else anybody wants me to dive into in particular? So where do we see our company 5, 10, 20 years from now? Great. Well, let me, let me start with the basics of, you know, how, how does one get here. And I think that, you know, that, that's a very difficult question to answer because it, it forces you to talk about yourself, which is uncomfortable. I don't typically spend a lot of time in front of audiences of any size really talking about myself. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I think are some of the key attributes of, of how people also with luck get here because luck whether you know we tell you or not luck features prominently as well i think in in this equation a lot of people won't tell you that they, they they'll tell you they they make their own luck maybe i don't know uh, when i got to cisco systems in the early 90s Nobody knew who we were. I was employee number 71. It turned out to be pretty lucky. When I got there, revenues were $60 million. When I left, there were $40 billion in 10 years. $60 million to $40 billion in 10 years. That's hard to do. And that's a good choice or luck. You'd be surprised because, you know, first of all, I grew up in the Bronx. I grew up in the projects. I lived in a one-bedroom tenement in the Bronx uh, with a very hardworking mom and dad. My dad was a truck driver. My mom was a teller. They both worked full time. Uh, we lived in a very tough neighborhood. It was not an easy place to grow up. I was the minority in my neighborhood when I was a kid. I had parents with great values. Uh, thank God. I think that matters a lot. Parenting and, and how you rear your children. And that's why I think the presenter said, what do you want to be known as? I want to be known as a great dad because I know the impact it will have on my son. It will have a massive impact on, on him in his life the lessons that he's taught through parenting. Um, but when you grow up like that, and you go out into the world and you see what's possible, 
it makes you want it more. You know, you, you know I, I think very successful people, w whether they'll tell you or not, tend to be overachievers in nature. Being an overachiever is okay, by the way. Being someone who aspires to greatness is okay. Being someone who wants more out of life is okay. And, and, and so I think there's a bit of an overachiever in all of very successful people that you'll meet. Some may admit it, some may not. I also think very successful people have a, a fear of failure. Not an unhealthy fear of failure, right? Not, not a very unhealthy fear of failure. I, 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 I am still, I, I am still afraid to fail. I dislike failing. It bothers me. Um, but never to the point where I would cross the ethical line in business. So you have to know that. that that's really critical in, 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 in your career. Sometimes people are so driven. Sometimes they're such overachievers. Sometimes they have such a fear of failure, they'll do anything. They'll cross the line. And that's the difference between someone who I think can, can achieve your goals, your personal goals in life, and others who will, will not. So you have to have strong standards about the line that you won't cross. And sometimes when you don't, it's painful because others might, and they might win as a result of it that time, but trust me, you'll win in the end. I know you'll win in the end. And you always have to do the right thing when no one is looking. That, that's the most important thing when it comes. When it comes to ethics, do the right thing when no one's looking. And you'll always be OK. But I think that, you know, I think that a healthy fear of failure is one of those things that makes people successful. I think dreaming is good. As a kid, when I was growing up, I always, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but you know, visioning, had a visioning exercise. You know, you always thought about, you know, I spent a lot of time, you call it daydreaming or visioning, what I wanted out of life. You know, sometimes when you think it, you know, you, you think it, and you're really out there thinking about, gosh, this is where I'd like the end state to be. This is the current state. Here's the gap. It's a big gap. What do I need to do? How do I get from here to there as well? You know, and, and that's something that I think successful people do is they oftentimes plan with the future in mind, knowing what, what they want the end state to be, knowing where you want to be at some future point, knowing what you want your business to look like five years from now and where you are today and what steps. You have to almost make the assumption, if I did what I wanted to do in 2015, what would I have done in 2014, 13, 12, and 11 to get there? What were the things I would have done? Write, write it and then work your way backwards. I think very successful people do that, oftentimes to a fault, you know, to a fault. But very, very important, and I do that still to this day in business, that's a major part of our planning process, is thinking through where do we as a business want to be in our strategic long-range planning review process? And that, if that's where we want to be, what did we do? What were we successful at? What milestones did we hit working our way backwards to today? I think successful people do that all the time. You may not like this, but I think very successful people are extremely hard workers. I know I was. And I know, by the way, you will sacrifice a lot for that. You will sacrifice a lot. Some people get there through luck. I wasn't one of them. You know, we all know stories about people who, who are highly successful and they look like they've fallen into it. Some people do fall into it. Some people are just extremely talented in a certain area. I mean, if you're an athlete and you have great talent in a particular area, you may land there. What you do with it is a separate issue, because I know, I know lots of athletes who have made millions of dollars and are failing, and some that are broke. 
So you, you may get there. It's what you do with it when you're there that matters. But I, I do think that you will work really hard, many hours. And along the way, you sacrifice a lot. You sacrifice a lot, more than you know. You know, days are long, and they're hard, and it's arduous. It's a fact. You can't get there without working really hard, unless you get really lucky. And I never bet on luck. I just wasn't one of those guys who stepped into it. I, I think my journey in life helped me. You know, I, I grew up in a very poor family in a very difficult and tough area. Um, I grew up fast because of it. So I would say my journey in life helped, no question about it. Uh, things never came easy, so I had to work hard for them. Um, and along the way, it's important to develop mentors. For me, mentoring meant was a big deal in my life. People I wanted to emulate, um, people I thought could teach me both, both, by the way, what was right and wrong. Many of my mentors taught me as, as much about what works as, as much as don't, doesn't work when you study them and you work with them long enough. But I was lucky enough during my life to, to, to find mentors. And by the way, mentoring is not oftentimes a situation where you have a formal relationship with someone. That doesn't really work because they oftentimes don't have enough time for you. You may not have enough time for them. It's really st studying the people who are highly successful, trying to get some of their time, sit down with them, understand, trying to build a relationship with them, understand what makes them tick, and... And, and figuring that out. And then, of course, if they give you, you know, a couple hours a quarter, you're blessed to be able to study more. But I was very lucky in, with respect to mentors. So I think mentoring got me here, you know, uh, as well. I mean, there were people I, I, I hitched my ride to in my career that were, were really important to me. At, whether I, when I started my career at IBM, I was a co-op student. I was, work, I was working my way through college. I went to school at night. It took me five years to graduate because I worked during the day. I went to school at night my last few years after I played football in college and realized I wasn't going to be a professional football player. I just wasn't good enough. And my grades were suffering in my first year. I quit you know, my passion, which was sports and football at the time, and buckled down, went to work. And I went to work for IBM as a co-op student. I sold copiers. Many of you in the audience may not know this, but IBM used to sell copiers. And I ran into the, my first mentor at IBM, and he taught me a great deal about uh, customer relationships, about marketing, about selling, and life. And life. He was, a, he was a great man. And that year, I was the number one copier salesperson in IBM in the United States. And I was 19 years old. I was wearing shark skin suits. They did not go at IBM at the time. I was not your typical IBMer at all. Uh, and I had a lot of success. Why? Because I worked from 6 in the morning till 12 at night unless I was in school. And I was, I was determined, determined to be someone who made a mark there, who showed up on the radar screen of others. But mentoring helped me there. At Cisco Systems, one of the greatest CEOs, I think, on the planet today is John Chambers. He is, he is a friend of mine. He's a mentor of mine. He was a close mentor of mine. And he took a shot on me. I was a kid from the Bronx who went to work for Cisco Systems selling. And I was the number one salesperson my first year there. I was the number one regional manager my second year, the number one ops director the third year there. I kept getting promoted. And he tapped me on the shoulder. I was running the New York office at the time. And he said, I want you to move your family to Singapore, and I want you to run Asia. I said, you're kidding me, right? He said, nope. That's what I want you to do. I was married at the time. I still am married to the same woman 23 years, <laughs> 23 years later. And she said, no, I'm not moving. I don't want to move. You know, our family is 
big Italian family closely you know, around us, and I don't want to move. I took her to Singapore at the time. Singapore was on fire. If you remember, in the 90s, there was a lot of fires in Indonesia. They were burning. The trees were burning. The smoke was coming over to Singapore. She went over there. Smoke was all over the place. She's like, I'm not moving here. This is a disaster. I finally convinced her to move. Um, <laughs> John Chambers actually convinced her to move. Um, and it was the greatest experience of my life because I had to live in Beijing in China most of the time, building the China business for the company. And my eyes were open just tremendously to this incredible world that was outside of the US, this unbelievable growing economy, this incredible culture of China. China is a fascinating country, fascinating history, incredible culture, you know, a wonderful business opportunity for all. Then he tapped me on the shoulder and after I was in Asia for a few years and said, oh, I want you to move to Europe and I want you to run Europe. I said, okay, so you want me to move from Singapore to Europe now? Oh yeah, I want you to do that, okay. So I moved my family to Europe and I lived in Europe a few years and I ran Europe for the company. All of Europe, Middle East and Africa, another set of culture experiences I never would have had, another set of opportunities I would never have had, all because of a mentor, right? Somebody who believed in me and someone who took a chance on me. And you have to ask yourself the question, why? And I think if you ask John why, I never asked him. It's a good question, I'll ask him next time. <laughs> I think he would say, I really didn't know you, but you had incredible results in the job that you were doing. And results matter. And in business, whether you like it or not, results matter. The numbers you post are meaningful to your success. And you can't do well without hard work. So we saw somebody who was working their tail off, getting the numbers done, really didn't know me, had relatively reasonable personal skills in front of a customer, had done well, and he took a shot. But a mentor, and then, and then he and I, and then I studied him, and I still to this day do, he's a fascinating leader to, to watch and, and work with. And, and I've had so mentors a little bit along the way, really, really meaningful. So I, I, I want to stop there for a moment, because I, I think that I've given you a little bit of historical perspective on me, uh, some of, of the traits that, you, that I think make up uh, leadership that you normally don't talk about in this room. Right? You normally talk about what's, I think corporate speak candidly about leadership. I can give you all of that if you want it in spades. But I don't think underlying good leadership, that those things matter unless you have some of those other traits I, I described. Let me stop there and ask you, do anybody have any questions about that before I go on to innovation? It's okay. It's off topic. It's, you can be off topic. Okay. Um, um, I have a question about um, NCR's um, future adoption, I guess, in terms of the growth in online business and how is NCR adjusting? question was how is NCR adjusting to self-service online and this incredible movement of <coughs> online self-service. The internet is the biggest self-service technology in the world. Having come from Cisco, I have a great appreciation for the internet. Um, and I think as a company, it, it, it dovetails nicely with innovation, the next subject for, for me, because we are a company whose roots are largely in hardware development, hardware engineering, um, not necessarily in software engineering and or in multiple channels, but we've made a significant shift the last few years to move into mobile and online self-service. So you'll find NCR today, for example, on your mobile phone, if you're downloading uh, a WAP-based application from J.P. Morgan Chase to do mobile banking, it'll say on the bottom, powered by NCR. So you'll find us now both online and mobile. In fact, if you go back to your dorm and you go to blockbusterexpress.com, 
which is not Blockbuster, it's an NCR company. That's our website, and you can look at our movies. We 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 rent we rent about a million movies a week. NCR through kiosks and online, and so you can check out the movies we're renting. You can reserve it online. You can pay for it online, and it'll be available for you at the kiosk when you get to the store by a swipe of a card. We have banks that host all of their online self-service financial applications with NCR. We build the application and we host them. We do it for healthcare and we do it for travel. Um, if you go to the airport today and you check in at the airport using a self-service kiosk, eight out of 10 times you're using an NCR product. We have 80% market share in that space. So, and that's a merge channel solution because when you go online to orbits.com, anybody use orbits? We run orbits. We are orbits. Essentially, we run orbits. All of that self-service technology online is NCRs. And so I think we're adjusting well over the last several years as we change our company. But the change management program in the company the last several years to get there from here has been challenging, difficult, and, and fun. We have a long way to go as well. In healthcare, we do self-service check-in, we do appointment scheduling, we do wayfinding, and we are doing some front-end electronic, electronic medical record-like uh, applications, for example, prescriptions online. So if you go to a healthcare institution and you're checking in with a mobile web pad or a kiosk electronically, you know, we all go to the doctor and we fill out the same seven pages. That's really, it's really inefficient and annoying. I don't know why we don't fill out the same seven pages once and that that information follows us. That's the technology we build. It follows you. So you can fill it out once. And then you can check in so you don't need the people behind the counter to check you in after you fill out those seven pages and then they ignore you for, the few, you know, for a few hours. Um, you can also, with our scheduling application, you can schedule all your appointments with the doctor um, online and we SMS text you. Uh, to remind you about your appointment. We SMS text your lab results before you go to the doctor so you know what your cholesterol levels are before you walk through the door. There's a whole host of solutions we're now offering for healthcare institutions. The problem with healthcare is that healthcare institutions generally are not investing in technology. They are the laggards of all industries with respect to investments in technology. The typical SGNA, does it SGNA, Sales General Administrative Cost? Okay, the typical SGNA percent of a corporation's revenue, how much we spend on SGNA, is somewhere in the range of six to eight percent of revenues. In healthcare, it's thirty-five percent. It's egregious. It's completely inefficient. It's completely embarrassing. And because they don't, they've not had the same challenges, competitively speaking, that business has in, in, in terms of making their enterprise more efficient. They're not forced to, because most of them are nonprofits. And what's your goal if you're a nonprofit? There's a problem with the system, a massive problem with the system, not the least of which is it's 20% of our current GDP. You know, which is close to $2 trillion and getting worse, while patient care doesn't get any better. Technology can solve a lot of problems for healthcare, not all of them. But if they were more efficient and they were spending less on SGNA, they can buy better, better medical equipment. They can provide better patient care. They can lower the cost for you and reduce our taxes and our burden related to our healthcare system. It's not very difficult, actually. The issue is over-intellectualized in the press, in my view. They are not efficient, period. They are not incentivized to be efficient, period. Companies like NCR can help that.
The question was, is I, 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 I quit my passion early on. Um, am I happy I did that? And were there other avenues I could have, I could have pursued uh, with respect to my passion? Um, you, you know, in a, in a, in, when you're an athlete, in a, I played at a Division II football school. I played Division I AA, Division II. And you, quick, you quickly realize, you know, whether or not you, you, are, you are good enough when you play against other people who are more talented than you. And you have to be pragmatic, I think, with respect to, you know, is, does, does this particular avenue have a future? I, by the way, I am now living through my son. <laughs> I am vicariously living through my son. And of course, I'm putting all the pressure I can on him um, to be hugely successful. And I tell him that, just so you know, dad has an issue here. <laughs> and you just need to be aware that dad is, is going to live through you. And if you fail, I'm going to be pissed off. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but he's 14 and bigger than me, so he, he has a better shot. Um, so I did have options, you know, other than that. Um, but, you, you know, you will find, you will find that you have to seek out what's underlying the passion. For me, it was competition. There's no better competition than business. Business is great if you're a competitor. And that's another trait of a really strong leader. I find most of them are really competitive and hate to lose, despise losing. It's visceral. So for me, what I found in business was I found competitors. They wanted to win. They wanted to beat me personally. And when they did, by the way, they took money away from me. You know, I, they, they, it was, it's real. You know, business is highly competitive. It's real. When you're on the you know, when you're pounding the pavement, you're fighting against direct competitors who have similar products, similar services. It's you against them. So underlying this, this great passion I had was this really strong competitive spirit that I found played really well in business, and, and I love it. And I still to this day love to compete. Love it. There's nothing more fun than, than beating the competition. It's, it's great. How do we survive the recession? Um, we buckled down in terms of cost and expense as hard as we could. Um, but we didn't sacrifice investing in the company. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing in front of you because we've invested many tens of millions of dollars coming to Georgia uh, from Dayton. And that's a long story and a very interesting one if we had time. Um, we focused on the world the way it is, not the way we wanted it to be. We focused our time on the things we can control, not those things outside of our control. I can't control the macro economy. I can't control my customers' budgets. I can't control geopolitical instability. I can't control sovereign debt. But I can control my expense line, my budget, the way we behave, those things we invest in, how we work day in and day out. So we focus on what we can control. And we're also a strong company with a good balance sheet, lots of cash, and that helps, helps see your way through these periods of time. But it's, it's, by the way, it's not over. Right? This period, the, the, the Great Recession is not over. Don't, don't read the press. <laughs> it's, it's a misnomer to suggest it's over because what we have in front of us, I think, is, and this is an overused phrase, but it, it does describe it well, the new norm. This is very new. And the world in which you live is very different than it was three to four years ago. Just as much opportunity, just as much excitement, I think, but different. You know, so you need to adjust 
to different. Going off of your move from Dayton and then how do you personally deal with negative press? How do I deal with negative press? Not well. <laughs> uh, anybody who tells you that negative press rolls off their back is full of you know what. If course, negative press really bothers you. It bothers me. Maybe it doesn't bother some people. Um, it bothers me. How you deal with it, though, you, you, know, you, you deal with negative press well before the negative press by making decisions that you think are right and that are ethical and dignified in terms of how you execute them. So well before the negative press comes, you should have thought through whether or not you handle the situation properly. Sometimes you don't. You, you will make mistakes. I've made mistakes. You will. And sometimes negative press is warranted. Sometimes it's not. I would say most of the time not. Most of the time not. Uh, but there are some times it is. And you have to read it. Take a step back, have a conversation with yourself. Is, you know, what do you think about that? Is that true? Do I have to change something about myself? I think highly successful people, by the way, also have an intangible that's really important for you to know and to get in touch with, and that's EQ. I think highly successful people have a very high emotional quotient, not an IQ, but an EQ. I never had the greatest grades in the world. I had good grades. I didn't have the best grades. I had good grades. 3.0 student. I wasn't the best. I didn't go to the best school in the world. But I'm entirely self-aware. I think I'm very empathetic, meaning I can read people fairly well, and I can be empathetic. And I'm appropriately self-confident. Enough. So EQ is important, particularly self-awareness. You have to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. Because if you don't know what you're good at, you will never hire the right people. And if you want to be really successful, trust me, you have to field the best team you can in the world. And that means that if you're not good at something, Go find that person who's good at that and put him or her right next to your side. And that takes self-awareness to a degree a lot of people don't get in touch with. They're not able to reach inside and say, I suck at that. I'm going to go get somebody who's good at that. Right? And that's, that's an important thing to do. And, and then em empathy, I think, is, is critical because you can't manage people unless you can get to know people and you can be empathetic with people. Most managers are completely, you know, they're missing that, right? And there are so many different ways you can touch people when you lead them. You know, so many little secrets of how you can touch people. If I stand this close to this girl, she's feeling differently right now, I can guarantee you. <laughs> But I can have a different conversation with her. I can have a personal conversation with her. And she'll feel differently when I walk back. Don't you? <laughs> so empathy is important. Um, you said you had very good experiences with being mentored. So my question is, are you actually mentoring someone else? I, you know, I, I do as much as I can mentoring. It just takes a lot of time and effort. I do as much as I can. I mentor the people, honestly, that I think have the potential uh, to be great. Because I don't have time for people who don't invest in themselves, don't have the, you know, don't have the aptitude, candidly, don't have the results. Uh, I don't think we'll get there from here. So there are, I can, I'll mentor as many people as possible if they have aptitude, results, and desire. And I see that intangible burning spirit, you know, that thing that you, can, you can't see but you, you can't touch but you can feel in a room with someone. I, you know, I, I look for passion. I look, I look for three things in people. Passion. I look for intensity. 
and I look for ethics. I assume when you walk in the door, you, you, know, you're, 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 you have an intellect. Sometimes you don't, but <laughs> they're quickly ferreted out. <laughs> Gentleman, the green in the back. When I was a young kid, did I ever start a business? My first job was a, I ran a paper route. I never started a business. I, I started a paper route when I was 11. I worked as a, um, a janitor in my school for the summer to make money. Um, uh, I worked at a variety of jobs in a video store, selling movies. Um, anything, I, anything I could do to pay for school. Tips or strategies for work-life balance? There isn't any. If you have a desire to be very successful, you better have a partner in life that's signed up to what comes with it. I have no work-life balance. I never did. I never will. I try hard. Like, I won't miss any of my son's football games. <laughs> because, of course, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm very, I'm, I'm, don't you do that, right? I'm his coach. But I will miss his basketball games and lacrosse games. I have to. Uh, he's not that great at basketball and lacrosse. Don't tell him I said that, Graham. But, I, I, you know, you can't make everything. So you, what you have to do is make what's important to you. Uh, on, um, it's a meeting. It's on my calendar. It's a meeting, meeting with Sunday football match, right? You have to make it important. You have to stick to it. Date with wife on Friday. It's on there. If you don't put it on there, somebody will take it from you. And, and by the way, when you're very successful, you got five people planning your day for you. I mean, I, I look at my calendar in the morning. It looks completely different than the day before. And things are stuffed into 15-minute increments. You know, as opposed to an hour increments, right? So it's very different. But work-life balance does not work, in my view. You can try, and for women in particular, I'm going to give the women in the audience great advice. I have very successful women who work for me, who have achieved work-life balance to some degree. I give them massive credit. Women, I find, generally speaking, particularly if you have children, um, are better time managers than men. Much better time managers. They're, they're far more superior time managers. And I find that they work later, and they tend to work on weekends more than, than, the, than men do. Um, and, and when you find, if you are a man in the audience and you are very successful, I would argue that you, you, you will, when you have women who work for you, you know, there are big differences between very successful women and very successful men who work for you. Um, it gets back to EQ, the discussion we had before. You, you, will, you, will, you will learn a great deal about how to work differently yourself. I learned from the women who work for me how to work smarter, how they do it. And I'll ask them. I have one woman, one woman who works for me who's uh, my general counsel, and she's got several children. and. I always ask her, how, did, you know, how, how, how are you able to carve that? And she said, well, this is what I do. You know, this is my, my plan of action. How I go, oh, that's, that's good. You know, I, I never really thought of that. That's, that's a good little trick. Mistakes I've made in my career, I have probably you know, made more mistakes on accident than you have on purpose right now at this point in your life. But you're going to make a lot. And you have to be, I think, I think you, you really have to be comfortable with the fact that you're going to make lots of mistakes. Uh, mistakes I've made, I made a few blunders. Um, One has to do with um, be careful, you know, you don't, 
you have to be more, I think patience is important in work, particularly when you're younger. You know, I was very ambitious. If something came along from the outside, I looked at it, you know, and, 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 and I would maybe, you know, I'd, I'd go on those interviews and take a look at that job. And um, oftentimes it didn't turn out to be what I expected. It, grass is n really never really greener on the other side. It's just a different shade of green oftentimes. I mean, there are good reasons sometimes for you to leave your, you know, your, I'm not, I'm not advocating stay in the same company for 30 years. That doesn't work anymore. But be careful you're not jumping ship because you're so ambitious to get to the next job, the next title, the next $20,000. That, that could be a mistake. I've made that mistake. You know, and it cost, it, it did cost me, I think, experience and, and, and otherwise. Um, I think, um, and by the way, my, one of my mistakes was leaving Cisco at the time I left Cisco. For me, I was on an incredible track. Um, and, you, you know, I don't know where I'd be today, but I think it would be uh, a role that I would have enjoyed. Now, in hindsight, given where I am today, I can look back and say it was a good decision. But at the time, I probably it was one of those situations where I was, I was anxious, right? I wanted to, I wanted to be a CEO. It was offered to me, and I jumped. And perhaps what wasn't the best decision uh, to make at that time. Um, I would say um, other little things you should watch out for. Um, <laughs> it's a cutthroat. Business is a cutthroat world. Be careful. Um, this is going to sound, uh, maybe you may not like this, but I, I think you have to be less trusting, a little less trusting of people and their intent and their motivations. Now, maybe it's just I've been burned. Maybe it's the bad press stuff. I've gotten lots of good press as well, but I think putting that aside, I think you have to be very careful in business because not everyone has your best interests at heart, not your colleagues or your boss. Or, and that's not to say that there aren't good people that we, you'll, you'll, you'll find around. You will. I, and by the way, when you find them, when you find good people, latch on to them. You know, and, 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 but just be careful. Um, if I think of anything else along the way, I'll, I may. If it jogs my memory, I'll tell you. Um, and then going back to the negative press that you have to people, at least they not enjoy it, what do you think is your strongest reason to combat it, especially in regards to newspapers from Dayton that may be a little bit biased? The best way to combat the, 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 the press, or negative press, and particularly the, well, that, that, that's my negative press event, really. I mean, I haven't much, my negative press event was when I moved the company out of Dayton. Um, And this is a hotly debated subject with me. So you hit on something that's interesting between myself and several members of my senior leadership team. Because you know, when, you, when you see those articles, the first thing you want to do is lash out and say, that's not true. And 90% of what was written is, was not true. Um, then again, do you want to get in a, a fight with the press? Where does that lead? Is that a useful? Is that useful time spent for me in my role to engage in a press fight with the Dayton Press? If it were the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, perhaps it's worth it. And I'm not saying that's, it's, you, gotta, you gotta understand your audience. Your readership is small. Um, you have to pick your, and choose your battles, I think, with negative press. I have gotten to a point, though, where if it happens again, I will set the record straight more, uh, more quickly, more in intently. That, by the way, you will get advice from crisis communications managers in your career. People get paid lots of money to tell you what not to do and what to do. To never engage in a press war. It's just not worth it. Let it go. It'll be gone in a few years. You know, nobody will remember it. I don't, I, you know, I, I just ethically can't, I can't allow that. If somebody is not writing 
fact-based truths. I can't allow it. Maybe that's, maybe that's a, a thing that I should learn from. Uh, but if it ever happened again, I would be much more quick to the punch to set the record straight than not. That's advice I think you have to be careful with because there are people who would tell you not, not, not to do that. But I think it's unfair, right? And, and so if it's unfair, to me, when things are unfair, you have to deal with them straight up. I can't even fly over like Ohio now. <laughs> they have like Scud missiles with my name on them. <laughs> Although I will tell you this, LeBron James did me a real solid. <laughs> he really helped me out in Ohio. I was so pleased when he went to Miami. Besides perhaps responding more forcefully to negative press, is there anything else you would have done or handled differently regarding the move from Ohio? Because beyond the negative press, is there anything I would have done differently with respect to the move from Ohio? I've given that a lot of thought, and the answer is no. First of all, it was a flawless move. We announced it June 1st of 2009. We were done June 1st of 2010. It was done flawlessly. All of the potential downsides of the move in terms of losing tribal knowledge, domain knowledge, and talent never occurred. We're a better company for it. The talent in this state is awesome. The talent in this city is awesome. This school is a great feeder system for talent for us. Uh, we were able to acquire really good quality people uh, when we hired here in the Atlanta area. Um, I handled myself like a gentleman with the governor of Ohio, even though I, I could have buried him. I handled myself well, I think, with local politicians there uh, with dignity. Um, and most importantly, I treated the employees of our company in Dayton with dignity. And, and that's important. That was the most important thing to me, that people were treated well on the way out of the company, those who did not make the journey with us. Treated extremely well financially and post-employment wise. That to me was critical. And after that, the, the rest are distant twos. The ideas that NCR has to go into emerging markets vis-a-vis -vis innovation. First of all, let me just say this. Really important for you, critical for you, emerging markets. They're the future of business. And I'm not just talking about Brazil, Russia, India, China. They're the obvious. But there are tier two emerging markets like Indonesia, like Egypt, like Poland, like the Czech Republic, that are really important emerging growth economies, that companies who are global in scope like ours, we operate in 120 countries, need to have great success in. And they are different. They are fundamentally different than Western markets, mature markets, Europe, Western Europe, or the US, and critical for our growth, critical for you in terms of your success. You'd be surprised. I, we learn as much from the emerging markets as we probably are able to transfer in terms of knowledge. I think there's a, a mistake that some people make in that we can bring them technology that perhaps may be more advanced than they can develop themselves. That's not true. These are highly advanced countries and societies that have wonderful technology, wonderful talent, low cost, and are disruptive in quantum in their thinking. India today, when you go there, is, it's, it's a fascinating place for engineering, particularly hardware engineering. These, they're, they're taught to think in very disruptive ways about technology. Their idea of, of value engineering a product isn't incrementalism. It's, I want to think, I, I want to take, I want to cut the cost in half 
not by 20%. I want to create something that's more higher quality, better, at half the price. I mean, they just built a $2,000 car. I can't build a $2,000 ATM. So you think about what's going on in some of these emerging markets. We actually want to export some of that, in, in that, that skill set to us. So be, be smart enough and self-aware enough that when there's best practices elsewhere, you take them into your company no matter where they're from. No matter where they're from. Because what you're after is not best practice or doing things as well as another company has already done, but next practice, becoming the company that others follow. And if you're aggregating all of these great ideas from India, from China, from Brazil, from Eastern Europe, from Africa, another great opportunity coming. And you're aggregating this thinking, this knowledge, and collecting all this knowledge, and sharing all this knowledge, you'll be a better company for it, a better system. It's a, companies today have to become social networks within themselves. That's going to be very hard for a lot of companies because they're not thinking in a contemporary way of how to share knowledge and information across many, many different types of barriers and boundaries. There are lots of barriers and boundaries in companies. There are, they're institutional in some ways because most companies are built very hierarchically, much like military was. I mean, most organizations are built like military foundations as opposed to social networks. And that's going to change over the next 10 years. There's going to be a lot of innovation in organization structure and how organizations are designed, built, and communications is layered into that. But emerging markets for us are critical. We are, by the way, 80% of my revenue does not come from the United States. It comes from outside the United States. We're a bigger company in Europe than we are in the U.S., we, do, we are the world's market share leader in the emerging markets. I have the highest market share of any of my competitors in China, including Chinese companies. So you need to think about that because doing business there is very different. Having lived there, I can tell you doing business there is incredibly different than it is here. And you have to understand it and know it at a level of, of, of capability that allows you to to be successful there. Let me take that gentleman. Four years. So how do I how do I adapt to a different culture? How do, how did I adapt to a different culture? Well, I can tell you the first day I landed in Beijing. This kid from the Bronx, I, got in, I, was, I was walking through Tiananmen Square with a cappuccino, and I was thinking, wow, this is, this, is, this is new. This is not where I come from. And you know, by the way, when I was there on the weekends, I was also like one of the tallest guys. <laughs> so I was like the greatest basketball player in Beijing. Everybody wanted to hang with me, right? So I was like awesome until I came back home, and then I got killed playing <laughs> basketball. But... I had a lot of fun there. I made a lot of friends there. Um, and what I decided to do was to learn the only way, again, self-awareness, the only way for me to be successful there was to figure out uh, the country. And I needed to dig into their culture, their history. I think if you dig into a country's history, you learn a lot about the country you're doing business in. These books like Kiss or Shake Hands or Kiss, Hug or Shake, well, I don't know what the name of the books. There's lots of books out there. Do yourself a favor. If you're going to go to another country, learn about its history because it helps shapes. It helps shape the culture and thinking around people. And, you know, China has 5,000 years of history. Uh, we have a little over 220 in the United States. It's a little bit of a difference. Um, and you need to learn it. You need, to be, you need to really understand it, understand the culture. I mean, one of the things that shaped China so dramatically, still to this day, is the culture of revolution. Mao's culture of revolution. I mean, it still, it still has massive impact on particularly digital immigrants like me, my age group, how people think. 
how they think. And so um, for me, I, do I dove into the history, the culture. Um, I, uh, I read everything I could read as quickly as I could. I'm not a reader. I don't read a lot of books. I can't remember the last book I read end to end. Um, I spoke to a lot of people. I created a lot of relationships with people. Now, I was also a little bit lucky. This gets back to luck. I was working at the time on what's called China Net. So I got the chance to meet with the president of China several times, Jiang Ximin, and his whole staff. Uh, one of my mentors, who turned out to be a guy named Zhu Rongji, who at the time was a very senior level person in the Chinese government. Um, I worked with um, a number of senior level people because we were essentially laying the groundwork for the internet in China in all the universities. And that was a very large billion dollar deal. So I was lucky enough to be in a situation where I, I, I was ingrained very quickly into the society and culture by virtue of the people I was meeting uh, as well. Uh, I would also tell you that a hard thing for Americans to do when they go overseas and they visit particularly emerging markets, and because when you go to an emerging market, you know, what do you see? You see poor infrastructure, and you're like, these people don't even have roads. You see a, a confusing culture around you, and the cultural norms that you, you know go away, and you create this, this wrong perception immediately that we are more superior, we know better, we're the smartest guys in the room. Take that and bury that crap. That is not the fact. Because if you have that attitude in those countries, there is no way you'll be successful. Um, be a learner. Be a learner. Be somebody who wants to learn from them, wants to understand their culture, understand their business practices. You know, in China particularly, you know, th that's one country I could tell you where you know, if you do business in Western Europe or the US or other markets like Brazil, I would describe decision making kind of you know, either horizontal or vertical. In China, it's diagonal. You know, their, 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 their political system, their business system, their culture, all is figured into how they make decisions. And it's a mind bender for, for, for Western, Westerners. It's a mind bender, unless you figure it out. I mean, it could really throw you off. Oftentimes, what they say is not what they say. The way they communicate is different. So. You have to learn the markets you're going into and be humble enough to want to learn from these markets. Uh, as a leader, where do you see the world in 20 years? Where do I see the world in 20 years? I'm an optimist by nature. My belief in life is that optimists and pessimists die the same way. They just live their lives differently. I'm an optimist by nature. And I think in 20 years, um, I think we're going to see a tremendous amount of, of, of rapid innovation. I think we've seen in the last 20 years incredibly rapid innovation, right? Uh, escalating innovation quotient. 20 years ago, nobody in this room knew there was an internet. Look at it today. I mean, it, just think about it. 20 years ago, I was carrying around a five pound Motorola cell phone. It worked so intermittently, I just look cool having one because it never worked. <laughs> the, the speed of technology innovation is going to change so dramatically, so quickly. And I think it's going to be a world where we see great advances in, in medical advances, great technological advances. And I only hope that those advances advance mankind at the same time. Because that's the one thing that I worry about a bit, is, is how do all these advancements affect something that's completely disconnected from them, which is the human spirit, the human condition, if you will. Because I don't like some of the things that have happened from a technology point of view to the human condition today, right? I mean, I, I, I think that my son goes too far on texting. You know, if I can't have a conversation with you at dinner, because your phone is on your lap and you're texting eight miles a minute, that's not good. Right? That's not healthy. 
you know, if you're completely absorbed by texts and emails in your life, you, wh where does the, the most important aspect of business come into play, which is building that relationship with people, the human condition, if you will. I think the notion of, of some things I see on television, you know, that have, that have changed the way people think are, you know, crazy, this Jersey Shore crap. <laughs> I mean, really think about it. Think, th think about the entertainment of value of that show. A, a kid from the city, I can tell you, I, I mean, it's, it's scary. You know, so I think there are, there, are, there are advancements in technology that have to help the human condition as opposed to the opposite of them. But I, I'm very optimistic about the world. I do think China will become the largest, the largest economy within 20 years in the world. So if you don't know Mandarin, I suggest you take it. Uh, it is a wonderful language, very difficult language to learn, but I would argue it's one of the most important languages to learn. And if not for you, for your children to learn, um, I would tell you that the emerging markets are going to be, in 20 years, the most important markets in the world to be successful in. The world will be far more connected. I don't know how it can be, but it will be, than it is today. Uh, and I think the U.S. will continue to be very strong, regardless of the, you know, the, the whispers of our demise. I think we'll be very, very strong as a nation because ultimately this country is made up of great people and, and a wonderful spirit.